I want to welcome you to Christ Community Church. My name is Stephen Watson. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are new or visiting with us today, we're very grateful that you're here. You'll notice on the chair in front of you, there should be a welcome card, and there's another card with a QR code. Uh, those, both of those cards would kind of accomplish the same purpose. If you would fill out one of those cards, and the paper card you can just drop off in the offering box. It's a black box on the back wall. What we do with those is we send out an email saying thank you for coming, but also it has more information about who we are and what we're about as a church. And we do that because we know it's going to be difficult in finding a church home, and we want to help you out in that process as much as we can. We also send out a weekly email, which serves as our bulletin full of announcements and updates and other things that are going on, so you can keep your eyes open for that. And also you can respond to that to RSVP for different events. One of those events coming up is what we call our Next Step Dinner. It's going to happen on the evening of September 22nd. Uh, this is a dinner that we serve barbecue sandwiches at, and it's just a chance for uh, newcomers to meet staff, to hear the history and values of the church, find out how to get plugged in to, to the life of the body here. If you're interested in coming to that, we do have child care at that event. Uh, if you're interested in coming to that event, you can RSVP by emailing office at Christ.communitychurch, or you can respond to the weekly bulletin, or... You can just grab me after the service and say, hey, write my name down for the next step of it, and that'll get you RSVP. This evening at 4 p.m., we have our first women's study group. This is a discipleship class where we uh, are studying the Bible. This Sunday, we're going through Genesis 1 through 11, doing a broad overview, and then throughout the rest of the semester, we'll be going through the rest of the book of Genesis. Uh, the women will gather in this room. We'll move out some chairs, set up some tables. Uh, we'll meet in this room, and we will we'll just go through the book of uh, those first few chapters of Genesis. Just a time of um, fellowship with other ladies, time of engaging with the Word of God, so we invite you to come to that. We do have child care for, for ladies whose husbands are deployed or who might be a single mom. Uh, so it's, it's a limited child care. So if you need that limited child care, uh, you can just let us know. You can let me personally know. We'll just make sure we have enough child care workers for you. Uh, otherwise, uh, leave, leave your kids at home with dad. That's really one of the main purposes. We alternate those men and women uh, study groups on Sunday evening. And then on September 14th, that's next Saturday, if you are a, a, a family and your husband or your wife is deployed, you can come drop your kids off on September 14th here at the church from 9 to noon. And we'll have people up here to play with your kids while you go out and have a cup of coffee or, or shop by yourself or whatever else you need to do. Uh, but that's coming up this coming Saturday. And if you could, I know we'll, as, as we stand to sing here in a second, we'll have another wave of people come in. So if you could, if you could move towards the aisles whenever we stand up. So um, this will allow our ushers to kind of seat people on the sides as they show up here in a little bit. If you would, please stand for our call to worship from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together.
Isaiah chapter 6, whenever Isaiah the prophet sees a vision of God high and lifted up in his throne room with the angels around him singing holy, 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 the response of Isaiah is that he fell down to his knees and he said, woe is me for I am unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips from a people who is unclean. And he used that opportunity of seeing a holy God the, the, the proper response is, is confession. The proper response is, is seeing our own sin. So that leads us to our verse of confession found in Psalm 34, verses 4 through 6. It says this, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look at him are radiant with joy. Their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. And saved him from all of his troubles. Whenever Isaiah saw his own sin, he was distraught. He was brought down low. The, the, the weight of the holiness of God was upon him. But what do we see happening in Isaiah chapter 6? But Isaiah's sins being forgiven and his face being lifted up. Whenever we see the holiness of God and respond in a confession of our own sin, the response of God is forgiveness of sins. And he provides a way of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Let's take the opportunity for the next few moments to silently confess our sins to God. The psalmist continues in verse 34, verse 8. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is a person who takes refuge in him. Heavenly Father, you are a holy God. You're a holy God who hates that which is wicked, which hates that which, which is sinful. 
But Lord, even while we were your enemies, you loved us and you sent your son to die for us, to provide a way to receive the forgiveness of sin. Lord, we have tasted and we have seen that you are good. We have taken refuge in you and we have found peace and happiness there. So Lord, thank you for forgiving our sins and thank you for lifting us up and reconciling us to yourself. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Christ Community Church, remember that in Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. We have a time of confession and assurance of pardon at this time in our service because it leads up to this ceremony that we call the Lord's Supper. This is one of the ordinances of the church, and we, we, we participate in this ordinance on a, on a weekly basis. It's a time where we are to re renew our covenant with Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're a member of Christ Community Church or not. If you have your faith and hope in Jesus Christ, we invite you to participate with us. However, if you don't know Christ, if you're not following him in faith, we would ask that as you come forward with the rest of us, that you just say, not today, pastor. And that will just be a sign to us that you don't want to take the elements. We'll pray a prayer of blessing over you. And just so you know, that doesn't make you stand out at all. No one will notice. It's a quite a common thing in our church for people to do that for all sorts of reasons. But the reason we'd ask you to do that is a very simple reason. Because whenever we take this representative cup and we eat this representative bread, what we are doing is we are proclaiming our faith in Christ. This is a physical act that, that portrays this, this spiritual reality that our hope and faith is in Jesus Christ. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room, and he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, then Christ took the cup, and he said, this cup represents my blood, blood which is shed for the forgiveness of many sins. And we are reminded that as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So come, let us eat and drink with thanksgiving.
All right, if you are in children's church, your teachers will meet you at the back door, take you to class. All right, if you all turn to me this morning with me to Acts chapter 15, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 35. Buckle up, it's a long passage. Verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the, by the church, the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul described all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it is written, After these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again, so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name declares the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God, but instead, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from the blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to select men who were among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. They wrote, From the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the brothers and sisters among the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some without our authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts, we have unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly beloved Barnabas and, Saul, and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who will personally report the same things by word of mouth. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision, and ours, not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch, and after gathering the assembly, they delivered the letter. 
When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Both Judas and Silas, who were also prophet themselves, encouraged the brothers and sisters and strengthened them with a long message. After spending some time there, they were sent back in peace by the brothers, brothers and sisters to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you reading that long passage. <clears throat> Before we get into today's message, let's take a moment to go to the word of the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us have your word in its entirety, Lord, and having the desire to hear from you so that we can apply your precepts to our lives in a way that brings you glory and honor, Lord, and is not a distraction to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today we're going to be talking about a life in context. How do we live in context, and how do we deal with things that we see may be taken out of context? And lucky for you, uh, Joshua Portwood here volunteered for something for me this morning. And talking about blind faith, he had no idea what he was volunteering for and still doesn't. Josh, can I get you to come here for a second? I got something I want you to hold here, all right? Okay. All right. Now, if I can have you go about halfway down the aisle and stand there and hold it over your head and stop. The other way. No, the, the, the stick. Up. Oh, turn around. All right. This is how little I know. And a half step to your left. There you go. Okay. Now, what does it mean when you're talking about things that are good enough? There are times in our lives when we deal with things that are okay to be good enough, and there's times when there's not, right? And it can be dangerous to our health when we start taking things out of context and not using them in a way that it was intended to. In this case, the scripture with taking the context of the law of Moses and applying it to people who it wasn't. Now, bear with me, because I did have shoulder surgery, and I'm not sure how far I can do this. Ah, okay, close enough. All right. Thanks, Josh. You can sit down. So, question for you all. Was that close enough? It's a pretty good throw. I mean, I've got to hit his arm, right? That's got to count for something. Like a half point, maybe? What if it was a hand grenade? Would that have been close enough? Okay, sure, right? What if it was getting the tires on your car aligned? Is that close enough? Eh, depends on how many often you want about tires, right? Maybe, maybe not. What if you had a heart attack and the cardiologist was trying to put a stent in your coronary artery to open it back up. Is close good enough for that? That's kind of hard to live with that one. You know, it's like, one, cool, you opened up an artery that didn't need opened. Thanks. I'm still having a heart attack. Here's your $35,000. Um, that being said, when is close good enough? But when is close not good enough? And I'm here to tell you that this scripture is telling us that when it comes to handling God's word and how we apply it to our lives and those of others, Close isn't good enough when dealing with context. For those of you who are taking notes, these are my three main points before you write them all down, and that way you don't end up with like having to write it twice. But the three points are one is context is key. The second thing is when we have context that is poor, it results in poor doctrine that then results in poor application and trouble for others. And then what do we do when we live in face of that doctrine or that fact that we have to deal with a world that is surrounding by telling us things that are Maybe true, maybe partially true, maybe close, but not quite good enough. So starting off, context is key, right? Well, let's look at the context of this verse. The easiest way when you're dealing with context is to apply the five W's and the, you know, the how, because then we can say, figure out how to say that right. Well, who is this passage to? Well, this is written in the first century AD to the church at Antioch. Antioch is a city that was located somewhere near the border of modern Turkey and Syria. At this time in the history... It had close to 500,000 people in it, we think. That's a half a million people. It was comprised of Romans, Greeks, Jews, Macedonians, and any number of peoples from that Middle Eastern area. It was very diverse. So why is this passage even important about that? Well, we're talking about people coming up saying that you need something more than Jesus to be saved for the people in the church of Antioch. This church, we can assume, is made up of a similar ethnic, ethnic and cultural blending as the population from which it's derived, correct? Well, so we have Jewish Christians coming from Jerusalem telling the non-Jewish Christians in Antioch they have to follow the law of Moses. And while you can probably get behind like, okay, I can get the not eating meat thing with blood in it. Sure, I can not walk as far on the Sabbath day. Great. But now you're telling me I've got to be circumcised. Okay, we really actually need to have a serious debate about this before I go that step. Are you sure we have to do that to be saved? 
And this is what drove the debate about whether or not the law of Moses was being applied properly. Paul and Barnabas were saying it was taken out of context. The Jewish Christians from Jerusalem were saying it's not, and they have to do this. But what do we do? Well, when it comes with talking about the context, we know who we're talking about and well and why. But the how is because applying the scripture inappropriately causes harm. And I want you to think about for the next second. Thinking about Antioch as a prototype, there's about 400,000 people almost in Bell County, right? So Antioch's roughly got the same population in Bell County. How many different cultures are represented in Bell County? How many different ethnicities? How many different beliefs? And that's not due in any small part to Fort Cavazos because it brings people constantly to this area, takes people from this area, and we always have a mixing of people. Antioch is no different than Bell County is today. And yet we're still responsible for making sure we teach people and live our lives in a way that shows people the correct way to apply scripture. Now, one of the ways we look at scripture and trying to determine the context is you have to look at the verses that precede it and the verses that come after. A simple example here is if you just read the first half of chapter 15, you don't know who Paul and, uh, Paul and Barnabas and these people are talking to. You look back at the end of chapter 14, we know it's Antioch. But sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes you have to look at the entire book that that passage comes from. Sometimes you have to look at the beginning of it and the end of it because the argument is nested within another argument. Sometimes you have to look at that passage in the context of the entire gospel narrative from the Old Testament through Revelations. But it's important and it's worthwhile doing so to prevent you from taking scripture out of context. Now I want you to think for a second, what are some scriptures that you have seen taken out of context? Anybody got any suggestions? I know there's a couple here. All right. What about Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And a scripture taken out of context. Right? Everybody seen that one used by an athlete or somebody who's like, I'm going to do this thing because the Bible says I can. What about Matthew 7.7? 7? Ask and you will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. A little prosperity gospel comes out of that one, right? No matter what, you, what it is you want, you ask for it, you'll get it. That's what that means, isn't it? What about Romans 8, 28? We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Anybody seen these verses taken out of context, potentially? But what is the danger of taking scripture out of context? What is the danger that the first century church here was experiencing by taking the Mosaic law and applying it in a way it was not supposed to be applied? Well, the authors of the Simeon Trust First Principles course, which is a short course for expositional preaching, they liken to taking scripture to support an argument. So let's say I've got a position. I'm going to preach on not falling over to my left. And so I'm going to find every scripture in the Bible that says the left is bad and I'm going to lean on it. They talk about that being drunk in the pulpit. But I'm here to tell you that even if you're not in the pulpit, when you cherry pick scripture to help support your own position, to justify what your own belief is, rather than letting that scripture guide and shape your beliefs, it's no different than being drunk in public. You're leaning on something that is going to cause you to trip and falter, and worse, it's going to cause other people to follow after you and trip and fall down over top of your body and prevent them from getting to Jesus. That's one of the dangers of cherry-picking scriptures. But I want you to reflect for the next few minutes on, do you understand the context of your favorite scriptures? Have you ever pulled a Bible verse out just to support something to prove you're right without considering what that Bible verse was actually talking about? Now, as we go into the next section, we're looking here, as the scripture says back in verses 5 and 6, that we worry about the beliefs we have on a context of a scripture, how that drives the, our beliefs, and that belief drives the creation of doctrine. Now, when we don't <clears throat> look at the meaning of a verse in context, at best it distorts the meaning of God's word, and at worst it becomes theologically bad doctrine over time. Now, I've got an example for this. I guarantee you that every single one of you has not been turning from sin and repenting in the right way, and I've, I can prove it to you. You ready? Mark 14, verses 51 through 52. Sound familiar? Anybody know this? I know somebody recognizes it. Let's read. So this is what we have to do to turn away from our sin. Ready? Now a certain young man, wearing nothing but a linen cloth, was following him. 
They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. So we think the young man here is Mark, writing about himself, and the him they're talking about is Jesus. So here's the only thing you have to do. So this verse tells us exactly what we have to do in order to turn away from sin, right? The first thing we have to do is we believe, whether right or wrong, that to correctly follow Jesus, you have to wear clothes made of nothing but linen. No spandex, no polyester, no Under Armour, none of that ring spun stuff, no flannel, I'm sorry, no denim. Linen, the scratchy stuff, cloth only, right? And now our belief about this passage then drives our applications or actions based on that. Now our beliefs, they can change what is right, what we see as wrong, what we see as required, and what we see as optional. Now, what do we do when we encounter sin? We've got our linen cloth on, right? We're prepared, we've got the full armor of linen cloth on. Well now, somebody's sinning, we strip down completely naked, we turn and run the other way away from it, right? The verse said it, that's what Mark says, right? It's, he's following Jesus. Y'all believe that, right? Please don't do that. I'm taking this entirely out of context. And at best case, if you do this, you're going to end up with a felony record and you're going to have trouble visiting your kids at school. Please don't do, don't do any of this. I'll address it later. That's an example of taking something out of context. Don't do that. But it's easy, right? It's easy to do that. And you can make a verse mean anything you want if you're willing to sacrifice the meaning of what it's intended for. But I want you to think about this. What is the context of this passage before we go in further so I can clarify it? Well, this is the night that Jesus was surrendered to the Pharisees in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified the following day. What Mark was happening here, Mark was following him here, and the people who were arresting Jesus were looking for his followers to arrest him as well. Mark was following him, and when those people that were trying to arrest him grabbed Mark, he wasn't trying to run away from sin. He was running away from, from fear of his own life. He stripped his clothes off and took off running just like Dave, or Joseph did from Potiphar's wife. He was trying to get out of there, not because he was running from sin, but because he was running out of fear. He's still running and turning away from something, but the difference between running out of fear and running out of repentance are not the same. That little bit of context changed the meaning of this verse entirely. But again, please don't wear linen unless you really like it. Don't get naked and run away from people. It looks weird and causes problems. Now, this is just a silly example of what it's like to take verses out of progress, right, or out of context. But I want you to think about the times that you have personally been the recipient of another person putting unnecessary requirements on you out of a misunderstanding of context. What was the context that we're talking about here? What were the believers in Antioch being told they had to do to be a good Christian? Well, they're being told that they had to get circumcised in addition to following the entirety of the law of Moses. What have you personally been told was required for you to be a good Christian? Have you been told that you can't wear pants to church? Have you been told you can't wear jeans? Again, linen cloth, right? Have you been told that if you didn't tithe enough money, you weren't a good Christian? Have you been told that if you didn't serve in the children's ministry, you weren't a good Christian? Sorry, Lindsay, I don't think she's in here. But seriously, what have you been told in your life that people have put on you that have hampered your faith and your ability to love and follow God? I guarantee you every single person here has been told something like that. And how did it make you feel? I'm sure it made you feel great that you didn't give enough money to the church. I'm sure it made you feel wonderful that somebody was judging your faith and your Christian walk based on your clothes. I know it made me feel awesome. Like, thank you so much for telling me I didn't donate enough money. And here's your $35,000 for my coronary artery that you didn't fix, right? Yeah, it made every one of you feel well. What happens when we do this to other people based on our own misguided application of scriptures in the Bible? Well, at best... We hurt other people, and through that, we hurt the church as a body. This leaves division. This leaves open wounds in the church, and it can cause church splits. It can cause, even worse, apostasy, which means somebody just leaves the faith entirely. And it can prevent other people from even getting to Jesus to know him because of the way we put ourselves in the path of somebody else blocking their way to Jesus. But what are we really doing when we're adding things to the doctrine of Jesus. What are we doing when we are saying, Jesus isn't enough? Well, what we're doing is testing the Holy Spirit. But what does that mean? In verse 10 it says, Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks? So like the scripture is saying here, we are testing God, making unnecessary requirements for other people. Testing God means nothing more than simply knowing what God is telling you to do or not to do, 
and then doing completely the opposite. It's saying, go to Nineveh, and I'm going to say, no, I'm going to go the opposite direction. We do this all the time. We've done this from the time of humans' creation all the way through the t- end of time. We're going to continue to do this. Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit in the middle of the tree. Sounds like a great plan. I'm going to go eat the fruit in the middle of the tree, the middle of the garden, rather. That's all it is. Testing God is knowing what you're supposed to do and not doing it. But, again, this is something that even on a cultural level, we see people struggling with, not even just an individual level. The Israelites, who had some of the most profound personal encounters with God, still did the same thing. Exodus 17, 7, he named the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites complained because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? I mean, that cloud and fire we've been following for like 40 years, something like that, all the food coming up from the heaven, part and seas, you know, all those things are great, but is God actually with us? Like, I don't know, like, it's kind of hard, like, that fire is kind of weird and all, Moses, your face is all glowy and some weird stuff, but I don't know, is God actually here? The snakes, I, I just don't understand it. The walls fell down, I, I get, but is God really here or not? They were testing God as a culture. And it wasn't just one time. This is something that happened for generations. If you look forward to Deuteronomy 6.16, do not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Massah. They're still doing it. We are still doing the same thing. We are taking scripture out of context and trying to make it fit our own beliefs. <clears throat> Testing God in our own lives is just a way for us to be drunk in public, to justify the way we are living, and it makes living a life that God wants us to live harder than necessary. Paul specifically cautions us against this in Galatians 5.1, where he said, For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm, then don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Just like we saw in verse 10. We're putting a yoke on ourselves, putting a yoke on other people that's not necessary. Why are we doing this? We've been set free. And when we do this, when we start telling other people things they have to do to be a good Christian, we are in making them submit to something that they shouldn't have to. We are giving them a standard that's higher than what God is holding us to. Jesus himself warns us against not doing that. In Matthew 7, 2, For you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. We should be measuring other people based on God's standard and not our own because that's the only standard that matters. Now, what does this say about the culture of Christendom in America? What are some things you've heard the church described of in America? I'll wait. What are some words? The church is full of? Hypocrites. There we go. And horseshoes. Uh, The church is a super nice place that's really kind, right? No, it's full, of, it's full of people who are judgy. They're judgmental. They're hateful. They're against this group of people because they believe or feel or do a certain thing. Have you ever seen the church in the news for this type of belief? Now, the culture of the church is based on the heart of its members. Now, I want you to think for the next few seconds while we're transitioning to the final point is, are you personally doing the things that God is telling you not to do or not doing the things he is calling you to do? And are you misapplying your own beliefs about scripture and understanding of scripture in a way that is creating a stumbling block or a higher standard for other people than what God is placing on you or me? So what? So how do we deal with this? So now we see somebody who's preaching false doctrine. The Judean Christians are coming back up from Jerusalem to tell the people they have to be circumcised and follow the entire law of Moses. But Paul and Barnabas are saying no. Well, have you ever been out in the sun, like say last August in Texas, and it was like a billion degrees outside, and somebody brought you a nice ice cold glass of sweet tea, or unsweet tea for you northerners? What is the first thing you say after that drink? Ah, There we go. Thank you for reading the slide. I appreciate it. It makes it an easier transition. But it's refreshing, right? So we see here in verse 2 that Paul and Barnabas directly go to the people who are spreading this misapplication, this misunderstanding of the gospel. Second, we see that they, when that doesn't work, they talk to more mature believers, the leaders within the church, and they have that discussion there, and we see that in verses 6 through 14. 
Finally, to prove their point, they let Scripture interpret itself. They go back and look at the Old Testament. This is at the Jerusalem Council. And they see that what the Old Testament said and what Peter Simon had experienced 10 years prior with his discussion about and conversion of Cornelius and how all this plays together to lead to them to say, we no longer have to live under the Mosaic Law. This is what we do. And lastly, if you find yourself on the other side of this and somebody is reproofing you or rebuffing you based on Scripture, be humble and submit to it. But before we go any further, I know you're going to say, Pastor, you were telling me a minute ago that they were trying to make people follow the entire Mosaic Law, the circumcision and everything, verse 5 and 6, 1 through 4, all that, right? But now, if we look forward in verses like 20, 15 through, let's see, what was it? 21, that we are now being told that they have to do part of the law. So they have to abstain from sexual impurity. They can't eat foods that's not kosher. They can't eat food that's sacrificed for idols. So why are you telling me that they, can't, they don't have to be circumcised and follow that part of the law, but you have to follow this other part? Isn't that contradictory? Seems that way, right? But again, context is key. So the thing that we have to deal with here is that they understood, they being the elders in Jerusalem, who they were speaking to. They were speaking to the church at Antioch, which you've described as a mixture of multiple different religions, multiple different societies, multiple different cultures, like Bell County, and they were being culturally sensitive to things that were going on in that community so that they wouldn't be a stumbling block. First off, I'm going to start from the back of the list that we're given in the text here with sexual purity. This is a direct command because it's good for them, it's good for everybody, and it was good for us. Sexual impurity or sexual issues and sexual sin are one of the most pervasive things in society throughout time. Whether it was in the first century AD dealing with like temple prostitution, the worship, and the, particularly in the German, the German, the uh, Greek or the Roman religious practices, or if it's us today dealing with issues with pornography or premarital sex, it is pervasive. And yet it's held by God to be a different class of sin than many others. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin as a person commits is outside his body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought at a price, so glorify God with the body. Now, what about the rest of it? The rest of this, talking about the eating food that was strangled or had blood in it or sacrificed to idols, we already know that Peter was told that this is not an issue, and that happened 10 years earlier when he saw the sheets coming down earlier in Acts we were talking about right before he went and met Cornelius. But why are they encouraging the Antioch Christians not to do these things? This is not because these things are necessarily a sin. It's because the elders know what that area is like, And they're wanting them to be culturally sensitive so that they don't prevent other people from having issues coming to God. So let's say we have Jewish Christians in the church, Jewish converts in the church of Antioch. They probably had friends and family who were also Jewish that weren't converts. Now at that time, Jews would not mix with Gentiles. They wouldn't eat with them. And that was why it was so taboo when Jesus was doing that with various people. Like people were appalled that he was eating with people who were not Jewish. And so those Jewish non-Christians were not going to talk to the Gentiles, especially if they sell them eating. But who they might talk to might have been their friends and family who had just converted. And if they walked up and saw that person eating food that they knew that person knew was unclean based on the Mosaic Law, they would instantly be taken aback and like, man, he's just, I can't believe they're doing this. And that, that might shut that conversation down because they were so offended that somebody they knew who they thought knew the law was doing something contrary to it. The reason this cultural context is important is because he's encouraging the Jewish Christians there to abstain from this, to not become a stumbling block for other people in that community to come to Jesus. And we know that we are not supposed to be a stumbling block, and that is throughout Scripture. We see it in Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother and sister. That's talking about believer to believer. 
Matthew 18, 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea, mature believer to immature believer. 1 Corinthians 10, 32 and 33. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone in everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many so that they may be saved. That's Christian to non-Christian and Christian to Christian in the same church. We are not to do things that put other people in a position that would cause them to sin or prevent them from knowing or being able to see God through our own actions. <clears throat> I wouldn't have a beer in front of somebody who is a recovering alcoholic. That would be wrong for me because I would be intentionally tempting them with something that they struggle with. Does that mean having a beer and alcoholic drink is wrong or a sin? No, but we're told not to be drunk. But again, it requires that person or me to be culturally sensitive to the person I'm around. Just like the scripture here is telling us, they had to be culturally sensitive to the community to which they found themselves in. In order to be sensitive to your community and understand your community, you have to be in your community. And in order to be in your community, you have to know the people that are in it. In order to have inadvertently avoid offending people, preventing them from coming to Christ, hear me out. This does not mean that you minimize their sin. This does not mean that you minimize their sin. What this does mean is that you maximize your love for those people. You have to show them that you love them enough to live in a way that's different to draw their attention without offending them. You have to show them that you love them enough to tell them about the gospel, about how Jesus Christ died for their sin, just like he died for your sin, was raised again and paid the price for that sin in the only way that was possible to restore us to relationship with God. They have to know that you love them enough to be friends with them, to be willing to tell them that and have that hard conversation. It doesn't mean we minimize sin, but we have to approach the sin in our communities in a way that is tactful, in a way that is loving and gentle. If you come out with boxing gloves on, you're going to get in a fight. You have to do it in a culturally, contextual, passionate, loving way in order to make that work. Like Paul said, he was tried to be everybody to every, everything to everybody, but he didn't compromise on his beliefs or his trust in Jesus Christ to do that. So what do we do once we've confronted the false doctrine and once we've dealt with it in our lives? Well, the first thing, well, the last thing we have to do, we see in verses 31 through 35, is we have to live in a way that is preventative in nature. We have to be part of our community a community of believers specifically because when you study the word of God on your own you pray on your own sometimes you are at a higher risk for seeing something that the scripture or believing something that scripture is not actually being used properly you're at risk for taking something out of context just like the Judean Christians from Jerusalem were taking the Mosaic law of context and putting it upon the Antioch church saying you're not saved unless you do this we run that risk but if you're in community of believers then you have other people to help you refine what that opinion is, what that belief is, what your understanding of that scripture is in a way that will let you get to the true meaning of what was intended based on the passage in God for your life. Separately, that means you actually have to spend time praying and reading the word. Because if you only read part of the word, you're not going to know whether you're taking it out of context or not. Sometimes it's helpful to know how Lamentations fits in the grand scheme of things or how... Ecclesiastes fits in the grand scheme of things. But if you don't know what the grand scheme is, you can't figure that out. It just becomes a book of rules, and, uh, not rules, uh, rules, rules. It becomes a book of rules, or it becomes a really depressing book about how everything is not worth doing, right? But again, you have to spend time in the Word. So I want you to think about this as we're getting ready to close. Am I being refreshing to other people in a way that is both kind and challenging false doctrine when I see it? Am I encouraging those people who need to be restored after they were hurt? Specifically, those church hurts that we suffer because of people putting requirements on us that weren't biblical. They leave us wounded. They leave us scarred. We don't see the elders of Jerusalem here abandoning that fact or hiding from that difficult conversation. What we see is them, it's not only sending Paul and Barnabas back with a letter saying, hey, we were wrong, this is what you need to do. They went the extra step and sent them with Judas 
and Silas as well, because those two people were sent there to both corroborate what the letter said and to say, hey, we love you enough to say what we did was wrong and the people that left from us were not without our consent and we know that you are hurting and we want to restore you and we want you to be encouraged that what you're doing is right and you don't need to be worried about this stuff that was wrong. Are we encouraging other people when we see them hurt in our church? Are we encouraging people or are we hurting them? And finally, are you building a foundation by staying in God's word, by praying and staying in prayer and staying in the Bible and staying in community with people who are like-minded so that you are able to withstand those trials when they come? We're all going to face false teaching throughout our lives here on earth. Sometimes it's going to be obvious, linen cloth, right? <clears throat> Other times it's going to be subtle. And it's especially going to be difficult when it sounds true and is based on a scripture that is taken out of context. We are called to continuously gather to worship, study, and pray to learn God's word in its entirety so that we don't fall into the trap of misguided teaching and at worst lead other people astray with our own error beliefs. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word you've given us, Lord. Uh, help us to be able to see what you wanted for our lives in your word, Lord, and spend time talking with you and reading your passage, your scripture, Lord, so that we are prepared to use it in the way that you intended and not harm ourselves or other people. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. an orphan lost at the fall running away when not hear you call father you worked your will i had no righteousness of my own i had no right to draw near your throne father you love me still i did love before you you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was sad. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you pay my debt. By your blood, I Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown, and you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night the spirit you made me see and I swore I knew the way on my own head full of rocks a heart made of stone the spirit you moved in me at your touch my sleeping spirit was dark and hard the light of Christ has shown all into a kingdom that could not be shaken heaven sin is in by grace and grace alone so I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone I will run the race by grace and grace alone I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone I will reach the end by grace and grace alone 
please remain standing for your, our benediction today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us have the entirety of your word, Lord. Let us be able to go out and be a guide along the path to you, Lord, instead of a security guard blocking the way for others. In Jesus' name, I pray. You're dismissed.